Hi everybody, it's Susan here. You are all very welcome. I'm first of all just going to let everybody in there and uh, just make sure that everyone's in and settled before I start. So I'm joining you here live from my office tonight and thanking everybody for, for joining us. So I'm just going to let everybody in there. Perfect. Yeah, I see that you're all flying in. So great to see that. Great, and great to see, great to see people joining in on a what's becoming a dark Tuesday evening to talk about this particular topic. Okay, so I see yeah, loads of loads of people popping in there. Brilliant. Brilliant indeed. Well, first of all, you're all super welcome. Like I say, my name is Susan Hayes Cullerton, and I am the co-author of Positive Economics. And uh, I deliver the Positive Economics webinars and uh, have been doing now for some time. Particularly as the new syllabus is now coming into its third year into operation. And of course, now we also have the Leaving Cert project and also and a really, really interesting time to be an economist and a time to be looking at the economy in general. So first of all, tonight's session is being recorded. Uh, so you can see, well, I can see it up here anyway, that we've a red little dot up there pointing out that this is being recorded so I will be sharing this afterwards with everybody and of course if anybody has any questions I'm going to give you plenty of ways to reach out to me afterwards. So the focus of tonight is very much focusing on effective study techniques and I'm actually somebody that didn't study economics at Leaving Cert, it wasn't in my school at the time, instead I studied economics in college and then when I went on to write the book then with Brian and Trudy after that, then I had to basically teach myself how to teach it and how to study it uh, through the lens of a secondary school and Leaving Cert student. So therefore, I truly know uh, an awful lot about how to make this work. And as I mentioned, I studied right throughout college as well. And of course, since then, you can't be a practicing economist without seeing an awful lot of how things work. So the five areas that I'm going to focus on tonight are very much focusing in around um, studying study tips for the leaving search. But number one, they can be carried across to lots of other subjects. They can certainly be carried into college and or whether you're studying any other exams as well. That is the whole point. OK, so first of all, I'm going to ask you for your thoughts, first of all, because I am going to pull up here my Instagram. Well, it's one of them anyway, and I'm just going to put it up here and in this, in our Instagram, I have created a story and on that story is a question. So I'm going to pop that there into the chat, first of all, for two reasons. Number one is to ask you your thoughts so we can, I'll, I'll be able to add this in then for everybody else. But the second reason is to give you a way to connect with me afterwards, if you like. I find, generally speaking, when I'm on the Positive Economics webinars, this is the way people prefer. So if you head on over there, I have asked a question. And uh, now there's a few stories that we've been running there today. So you can you can uh, go out there to the last one. And the last one is, what is, you can see, I'll just pop out there. The question that I put up here is, what is your best study tip? So that then we can share those with everybody else as well. I'm going to give you my five, but what is your best study tip? And then we will be uh, share, share those afterwards as well. Well, depending on if I can. So it's just also, as I say, it gives you a way that we can stay in contact afterwards, should you want to. I, as I say, I generally find that this is what people want to, to do when it comes to OK, perfect. Yep, I can see now that you've started to to look at that one. So I leave that there open. I'll keep keep an eye on it. And then afterwards, I'll, I'll share those with you as well. But I'm going to give you my number one, number one. And I often find that a lot of people underestimate this one uh, or else they assume that it can't happen. But I'll tell you my number one and my number one study tip and work tip <laughs> and work like long after school tip is to enjoy it. It sounds simple. Um, but it's what one that a lot of people underestimate. And I that's why I, I chose the title tonight. A lot of people like watching Netflix. And of course, I like watching it too. But thing is, is that people like doing it because it's enjoyable. How do you make studying enjoyable? Well, be interested in the topic in the first place. And I would imagine if you have chosen this subject for your Leaving Cert, or of course, you're choosing to teach this, then we're already there. But I would say, 
I am grateful to say that I have been in business now for quite a while. I've been in studying, studying for quite a while, longer than that. And I can definitely say if you can find a way to enjoy it, then you will outrun, you will outwork, you will outsustain anybody. And there's a couple of ways to find it enjoyable is number one, ask yourself, why is it that I enjoy studying this? Is it because in macro, it gives me a different lens to look at the world? That's what I always said about macroeconomics. It's a different way of looking at the way in which the world works. And to me, economics is everywhere. It is in every shop. <clears throat> it's in every government decision. It's in every business. It's in, it's in so many ways. It's as you're walking down, like as you're walking down the aisles of a grocery shop, as you're picking a flight that you're going to go on, if you're looking up a booking engine like booking.com in order to, to find a place to stay, whatever it might be. To me, economics is everywhere. And as a result, to me, that was always one of the ways that I really enjoyed looking and learning about it is, is that. It's also a way, of course, to affect really, really positive change. It really is. So, for example, um, yesterday I was just looking at the sustainable development goal. I'm sure any of you that have got to the sustainability chapters within positive economics or any, any way that you're studying it, you'll have to have discovered the sustainable development goals now. There are 17 goals globally that the United Nations have pulled like lots of countries together to agree on. And one of them, number two, is zero hunger, the whole idea of eradicating global hunger. And within that, I, you know, I was just reading into it and you might think that, okay, global hunger probably exists because there's not enough food in the world. That's absolute nonsense. There is enough food for every man, woman and child and the earth. The reason that it actually, that global hunger exists is actually down to other things like storage is that we can't get the four factors of production to operate in certain environments whereby people can actually get food out of the ground using labor so that and then carry it to somewhere where it can be stored, which is an engineering and a physics problem. Another reason is 80 percent, I learned, of the rice that is um, produced in, in Vietnam goes to waste because of extreme weather events. Flooding happens, for example. OK, so you might say, OK, well, that's a geographical issue. And another reason that emerging markets in particular don't do as well as they could do is because they actually can't get their product to market the ability to reach the markets aren't there. So when we look at monopolistic competition, when we look at oligopoly, monopoly, we always assume that the producer can actually reach the people who want and are interested in buying its product. So when I was looking at this yesterday, I was looking at it from a sustainability point of view, and I'm looking at, I was looking at it as a case study for an entirely different STEM initiative. I do a lot of work now in STEM with uh, so many of the things that we work on now within Savvy Teens. And I was just looking at that, at all the different lenses in which you can, you can look. And economics could do so much, so much around that. If you bring an economist in, if you bring an economist into that specific conversation with the engineers, with geography, with aviation, with government, et cetera. And I'm not saying they're not there, but my point is, is that an economist will look at that quite differently. So again, it is how could I, in my work as an economist or as an economics teacher, how can I affect better change? Another area that we talk an awful lot about in and different ways is in econ, different ways in economics and also in Money Matters, the other book that I wrote that's it should be now in every school in the country and um, because we gave it away for free through Edco, our publisher, is also the whole idea of shopping local. Is that through understanding the multiplier, by understanding the um, pr uh, propensity to consume, by understanding all of that circular flow of income, you can see how shopping local can really make a difference to local jobs to local businesses to the local environment as well as of course to taxes to employment and all those other things so that's why i really enjoy it is that i think that it's a phenomenal way to look at the world i think it can really be a vehicle for such positive change and of course the other thing is that it gives you a, a way to um to understand an awful lot of things that are happening at the moment and the number one thing that i'm being asked about as a practicing economist these days is without a doubt is inflation and you know also from your study of economics that inflation we have demand pull we have cost push we know what leads to inflation we know the the, the challenges that central banks have around dealing with inflation we know the tools the monetary policy tools that also central banks have in order to deal with it so because you know all that because you actually have an understanding of that and you're studying that or you're working on studying that it just gives you a different way of just understanding the way the world works. 
And then, of course, when it comes to applying for jobs later on, and obviously the teachers who are here here tonight, all of you are in those jobs. But when it comes to, for any of you students who are um, looking at the session this evening, when it comes to applying for jobs, economics is such a transferable skill because you can understand supply and demand. You can understand pricing. You can understand profitability. You can understand the big things that can have a big effect on you. Like, I'll give you another example. We have an American client. Uh, we've worked this American client now for 11 years and we are paid in dollars. So since the exchange rate has been absolutely wonderful from a euro point of view, because the euro has considerably weakened against a very, very, very um, strong dollar, it then means that we get more money. So when we're being paid in dollars, we're getting more money, which is great. But of course, on the other hand, is that the US client that we have who's selling into the European Union, they're getting less. So then that's having a knock on effect in them. And then they're saying, OK, now what do we need to do? How do we cut costs? How do we manage this? How do we sustain this? It's because I, I genuinely understand where it's coming from. I know what's driving it. I know the way interest rates are affecting exchange rates. I know how to read the news when it comes to understanding what the future projection is going to be like. That really helps me serve them an awful lot better. And that's business to business. But as an employee, of course, then if you're able to understand the trends that are affecting your employer better, well, then you're in more of a position to be able to help them, to be able to get promoted, to be able to analyze the information that you're working with, to understand the environment that, that, that the company is operating in, to see the opportunities as well. An economist is very good at spotting trends, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Very good at spotting trends, so maybe there's new opportunities that you can direct your employer towards, or yourself, of course, as well. And one last point before we get right into my five specific um, tips separate to the whole enjoyment one, because that's the mega one that is going to underpin everything, is I was listening to a podcast this morning as I was walking, I as I was as I was walking in into the office. I listen generally speaking when I'm in the office, which is a good few days, um, not every day, because I travel a lot with what I do. But as I was walking this morning, I was listening to a podcast all around British productivity. And it was analyzing how the productivity of the United Kingdom has changed over the last hundred years. And it compared it to Britain, oh, sorry, that is Britain, how it compared to France, Germany, Italy, and America. And one of the key things that it points out that other countries are better at is connecting industry and universities and the education sector in general and people. So how can you bring people, universities, the academic sector, and businesses, how do you bring them all together to make something happen with, with government support? And I think one really good example of this, and I would say this for everybody who's here, if for any Leaving Cert student, fifth or sixth year, or any year that you're in, I would say this could be of use to any, maybe your parents, maybe your aunties, uncles, maybe yourself in years to come, or for any teachers who's here tonight, this could be useful for you or any of your friends as well, is the Springboard Programme. And the Springboard Programme is a government-funded programme whereby the government funds courses to happen across Ireland. And when I say funds, I mean 90% funded for people who are in employment and 100% funded for people who are in unemployment. And the courses relate to the skills shortages that are across the board in the industry. So digital marketing is one. We're always crying out for people in digital marketing. Entrepreneurship is another one. Financial services is another one. But what do you need when you've got education? and you've got people, and you've got government supports. Well, what you'd really, really benefit from is also having a university backing that, because the university can then give certification. So if somebody comes to me applying for a job in digital marketing, and they say, I know how to create different promotions on Instagram, versus somebody that says, I have a certificate, a level nine certificate from Ulster University um, in a certain area well then of course then that credentializes it so much more and that's an example of industry namely businesses the university the government funding it and people as well the whole lot working together and I lecture on one of those I lecture in fintech financial technology that's the springboard program that I'm lecturing in I had my students last night and they are going through two modules two nights a week again 90% funded if they're in employment 100% funded if they're not and then they're going to do two more modules after Christmas and then put the whole lot together and Ulster University is backing that. And there's a range of universities who are working with Springboard. The one I lecture for is in Northern Ireland and I'm delivering this online, but 
the point I'm making is, is that's an example of a connection. So for me, for me as an economist, I'm not just seeing this program as, oh, I must tell such and such a person about that, you know, because there's, and by the way, there's loads and loads and loads and loads of springboard programs, data analytics, as I mentioned, digital marketing, loads and loads of them. But I'm not just looking at that and thinking, hmm, that could be a good thing for me to tell such and such a person about who's maybe looking to move career or upskill. I'm seeing that as that's a way in which we, as a country, are solving a lot of problems. We're enabling people to upskill post-college or without college at all. We're enabling skills shortages to be filled. And of course, the only reason the government knows what skills shortages are there is because the industry is telling them. We're working collaboratively with universities where it's not just about the day courses and the degree courses and the CAO. And then we're also enabling people independent of whether they're employed or unemployed to have access to this for future employment for themselves. And of course, if it, if it helps them to become employed or employed at a higher wage level, so it's higher taxes, higher consumption, more possibilities for those people, etc. So for all those reasons, economics to me is super enjoyable. Super enjoyable. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to put up my five, my five key, uh, my five key well, uh, study tips here. Before I do that, I'm just going to check over here uh, to see what your answers have been to the story. And also, will you please put it there into, into the, um, you can just put it into, into the chat. Just tell me, why do you enjoy studying economics? So why do you enjoy studying economics? That's my question. Why do you enjoy studying economics? So while I'm getting my slides up there, I am going to ask you that question. So you can just pop it there into the chat. Why is it that you enjoy studying economics? Okay, uh, I'll see them there as they're coming through. So, as I say, uh, here, where, what I'm going to focus on tonight is how to study economics while watching Netflix and five other uh, effective study techniques. So I've already been through the one mega one, like I say, which is to enjoy it. If you can find why you enjoy it, that will help you. And it's the same for French. It's the same for business. I, I Again, business wasn't a subject that I could study in school. It wasn't available to us. I did accounting. I did Irish, English, maths, applied maths, physics, chemistry, accounting and French. I did eight. And um, and that was the way I trained my brain. Even back then, I started this from second year in school. I started training my brain to think, OK, what am I enjoying about this? What am I enjoying about this? What what could I do to make this more enjoyable for me? That was always always what I did. OK, so as when it comes to Netflix, I'm going to give you three shows that I think are particularly useful relating to three different areas of the uh, economic syllabus. Number one is, oh, sorry, this is the background on me. We'll move on from all of that. There's a, I was going to, going to tell you a little bit my, about my story and how I got to um, doing some of the things that I'm doing, but actually I'll skip, skip straight on. Number one is this, uh, and it is Money Explained. Now Money Explained is, as you can see there down here, you can see the um, description. We spend it, we borrow it, we save it. Now let's talk about money and it's many minefields from credit cards to casinos, scammers to student loans. And what this does is it shows you exactly how the monetary system works. And as you know, we have a range of uh, chapters within the book that we have to focus on here. So monetary policy tools, how money actually moves, regulation, um, market failure, all of those tie right into this. So within this show, what it looks at is why is it that people borrow money? And you might say, well, sure, it's obvious because they want to take money from tomorrow into today. That's ultimately what credit is for. Yeah, that may be the case if they want it that way. But of course, the consequences of doing that mean that then you have to go on and think about, OK, how am I going to repay the interest? Uh, when am I going to pay the interest? Uh, how much am I going to repay in total? Also, it also looks in here, it looks at the psychology as well of money. So why is it that we do spend as much as we do? How do we spend it? Uh, looking at e-commerce. So when you spend money online versus in person, in a shop, etc. So this one is, um, there's a lot of kind of, you know, stories in here all around personal finance and so on like that. It's quite psychological, but also you can see exactly how the tools of money are actually used. Now, the second show that I wanted to refer to is this one, Rotten. Um, this one, now this particular episode that I would recommend is the one about uh, avocados. 
So as you can see here, this docu series, so it's a series of them, uh, travels deep into the heart of this food supply chain to reveal unsavory truths and expose hidden forces that shape what we eat. So in this case, it looks at avocados in different parts of the world, whether it's in South America, for example. And they talk to people around what actually goes into creating avocados. And of course, there's a lot of water, water in a very warm environment, um, the labor that's involved and where the labor comes from. And also then what it ultimately goes into, if you look at it through an economic lens, is looking at supply and demand. So it looks also at supply and demand. So when, when you come to consider the amount of avocados that are actually made available for people to buy right across the world, then it has to come from somewhere. And also, it also looks at then the higher and higher and higher demand that has been for avocados. So I don't know about you, but I certainly didn't eat avocados when I was 10, 11. Um, I certainly didn't grow up in a household where we had guacamole, for example, or I certainly didn't grow up in a household where we went out for avocado toast uh, on a Saturday morning. Or basically, my point is, is that in we have gotten far more used to eating avocados if you eat any type of Mexican meal at all. Um, some of you, let's say if you like to go for a burrito, and there's a range of those all over the place now, they, they might ask you, do you want do you want guacamole in that? And guacamole is fundamentally made from avocados. And then there can be other things in there like garlic and tomatoes and lime juice and other lovely stuff. But this show does actually um, point out to you exactly how supply and demand have entirely shaped so many other things. It's demand for avocados has shaped where water goes. Demand for avocados has increased the value of them. Demand for avocados has meant that more and more people are applying for more or are using up more and more space to grow them. Demand for avocados has changed the nature of labor as well, is that what labor is available in order to harvest this. And then, of course, all of those factors have influenced supply, all of those, all of those, those factors along the way. So that's my second one that, that I would suggest. And then this one is actually a Korean one. Um, personally, I watch shows on, I haven't done in a while, but I particularly during lockdown, I was, I was watching a lot of shows in French. Uh, on on Netflix, I watched um, Call My Agent. I watched Lupin. Uh, I watched Family Business. I watched Bonfire of Destiny. I watched a range of others. And in my, in my mind at the time, because we couldn't go anywhere, I was thinking, oh, this is kind of like my way that I could be in, in France in my head. So I used to do those. And I've really found that it very much sharpened my ear. Now, I did French for Leaving Cert. I did on higher level French. And... It, it doesn't like it doesn't leave you in many ways muscle memory so it stays in there until you can pull it out again so I often find that um if you if you immerse yourself into an environment like I was like I was looking at say let's say Lupa or I was looking at call my agent all of those were in French and I was reading the subtitles is that it does take more concentration to do that now I don't have a word of Korean <laughs> not a word of it and um, we do have a Korean staff member she lives in Dublin she works in our in our company and she's brilliant and she has taught me so much about Korean culture and everything but all that said my point is that I would be watching this one uh, with the English subtitles on same as um, probably lots of other people but why is it that I recommend this one well this one is all around entrepreneurship and it's about being in an environment where you've got ideas and you want to pitch them and you're pitching to investors so what this does is it gives you a uh, an example of getting access to capital, for example. Uh, it talks about um, specific entrepreneurs as well having to show how they're different. So well, what is being different? It's showing how you're different to your competition. So that's monopolistic competition. You don't have monopoly. You certainly don't have oligopoly and you don't have perfect competition. Every business who is a startup has to show how they're different. Uh, it also then shows you about the amount of work that goes into something. And if you think think of the example that we give you at the beginning of the book around satisficing, which is satisfactorily doing something um, so that it's sufficient. It's, it's a theme that we talk about at the very beginning. Um, it talks to you, it just shows you here how much effort can go into starting a business, how much time and effort goes into building something where you may not necessarily succeed. Uh, but then again, that is what business is all about. And then, of course, it also talks about or it gives examples here of when you get turned down for funding. And if you don't get funding, if you're not able to raise the money in order to build a business, that is one key factor of production. The other three then are inaccessible. 
whether it's land and the labor and the enterprise, you can't get the land. Let's say you can't get the money to build the shop or build your website if it's in a digital environment. Um, you can't pay staff, including yourself. And then as regards enterprise, as we all know, the reward for enterprise is profit, but you don't get any profit if you can't run the others. The other thing too is that in a show like this, it distinguishes between short and long term, is that short term, I, I am a startup founder. I have been several times. So I know what it's like to be able to work very intensively on a new business for a period of time. But if you can't bring in the money, if your customers don't buy or your potential customers don't buy, if your competition outruns you, if any of these things happen, well, then then the short run means that you can't get to the long run. You can't actually change those long term factors. On the other hand, I've also been in a situation where there has been more demand than supply. And therefore, you have to right, say, I'm going to take on more people or I'm going to expand the capability of our website to handle orders or all of the other things that you might do. And of course, again, in the book, we talked to you about, you know, a shop can't double their capacity overnight, but it can do over a year. The difference, again, between the short run factors and, and long run factors. So there are three shows, three shows on Netflix that I would that I would um, point out. So number one, there is, is money explained. Oh, sorry. Number one, there is money explained. This one is more about monetary policy, the money system, market failure, regulation, more the kind of the latter half of the book. And of course, remember, every time we talk about spending, every time we talk about spending money, just remember, we have the circular flow of income is that if somebody spends money, then of course, that money is going to somebody else's is pocket along the way. A part of that possibly might go to that. Therefore, it's going to the government. And if it's going towards paying for something, it's quite likely that whatever you're paying for has cost the person who's selling it to you something. So whether it is like I have a cup of coffee here in front of me, right? Well, what what's what's the cost of in here? Well, there's the cost of the coffee beans. There's the cost of the water and there's the cost of the cup. There's the cost of the person who actually made the coffee. And also then there's the, the cost of marketing it to me is that, of course, the fact that I'm sitting here in my office and I have a cup of coffee in front of me, it means that I had to know where to go in order to get it. So there was marketing there, whether that was Twitter or whether that was um, a sign up at the door or whether it was somebody who has signage up outside. So every time you spend money, money moves on. And of course, as we know, that's called the velocity of money. So monetary policy, interest rates, exchange rates, um, regulation, market failure. They don't talk about marginal propensity to consume. You will know what that is. All of those things um, refer to that one. This one is more micro. The direction that I wanted to give you here is supply and demand. So what is, you know, when we talk about all of the factors that affect demand, like tastes, like I mentioned, is it's incredibly, burritos themselves have massively exploded in popularity in Ireland over the past couple of years. Um, Mexican food is a relatively, relatively new cuisine, we'd say in Ireland. When I say relatively new, I'm going to say, I don't know, 20, 25 years as opposed to spuds. And I don't need to go back to the famine uh, to talk to you about the, the change in or the popularity and tastes. Um, now, brunch is far more something that, that people go out to eat at a, at a weekend. A lot of people, let's say, might have avocados and toast for their avocado toast for that. Um, more people like have, having avocados on their pizza. More and more um, health food, or avocados would be seen as a really, it, there's healthy fat in it if you look at it from a nutritious point of view. So there we've got demand, but of course then demand can also influence supply. And when it looks at supply, when you're looking at environmental factors, labor factors, and, and lots of other ones. And then the other thing I suppose that I should just mention in here very briefly is international trade, is we don't grow avocado, like, you know, I'm looking out my office window here, there's no avocado grown out there, or oranges, or lots of other fruits or vegetables. So also international trade ties in here as well, is that if we're buying avocados in, then of course, then that, that reflects in exports, our balance of trade, our, our balance of payments, et cetera. And then the third one here is startup. What this refers to, like I say, is entrepreneurship, access to capital, long run and short run factors. Um, if you can't get access to one form of one factor of production, it may prevent you from getting to the others. Similarly, I could say the same for labor. And that's a lot of you know, what's happening at the moment uh, around the country is that you see businesses closing because they can't get staff. So they have money, they have a premises, they have customers, therefore the, the entrepreneur would be able to make a profit. But if they can't get people, well then, then of course it prevents them accessing the other three factors of production as well. And it also, as I say, talks about the difference between short and long run. Okay, 
So um, I'm just going to stop there for a second and I'm just going to stop sharing and I'm just going to see here if there's any questions or comments so far. So pop them there into the chat and I'm also just going to keep an eye over here as well on story. So if there's any questions, so as I say, what I'd love to hear from you is why you love or why you're interested or what you enjoy about studying economics. And also if you have any questions, um, pop them in the chat there as well. And I better have a sip of sip coffee since it, you know, was forming a, a key part of, of today. Um, I don't see anything in there, so that's that's grand. I'll move on. So and I'll move uh go on to my second key thing that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Now, um, this is the next one. I just have to again make sure that I'm moving on in terms of my slides. Yeah, okay. This is my second, um, my second key tip of the five building upon the mega one as I say which is the um which is the focus on enjoyment okay this is something that I talk to to students a lot about is I remember what it used to be like saying I'm going to study on a Saturday for four hours and what I would suggest is that you change your approach then to more so focusing on the learning objectives now as authors our job was to put the learning objectives at the start of every chapter we had to do that and that's something that that discipline is put on at any textbook writer. Now, if you can really and truly understand a learning objective quicker than, let's say, the four hours, what I suggest you do is focus on that rather than time. If you say that you're going to study for four hours and you spend two of those hours kind of looking at your phone or checking things out on, you know, looking out the window or whatever, and then you get to the end of the four hours, well, then you've done it. Whereas instead, if you can say, right, on Saturday, let's, I'm just taking Saturday as a day. I just, I don't know how much you're in school or when you're not or what your culture is around homework or anything. So I'm just going to say on Saturday, I am going to entirely understand the circular flow of income, marginal propensity to consume, marginal propensity to save, marginal propensity to import. So that's going to be my objective. Uh, that is my plan. And what I mean by that is that I'm going to read through how it, what's said in the book, the book or notes or whatever I'm going to summarize it so I'm going to just summarize exactly what the key points are and then I'm going to look for exam questions in that area uh, I'm going to try and do three exam questions and I'm going to compare what I say in the exam questions to what the answers are and then I'm going to note down what I got wrong and where to where I could get that right in future if you focus on doing that and you do it in less than four hours well then you've basically achieved probably as much as you would if you actually said I'm going to sit down and study for four hours so that's what I would say is that focus on learning objectives instead and by the way I'm the very same I run a business and I don't come in here on any given day and say right I'm going to work today for eight hours and I'm going to take a break in the middle I, that's that that just doesn't happen at all I come in here with a set of, set of things that I want to achieve every day not always realistic based on the things that come at me during the day <laughs> and of course sometimes I overachieve I suppose you could say but in general, I come in here and I write down um, what it is that I want to achieve in any given day. And that's my goal. I And if I get that finished by four o'clock, well, then I finish at four. It's rare now because then I generally, there's more to do. But my point is, is if you focus on the learning objectives. So let me just roll back here now a little bit. Number one is all of the learning objectives are at the beginning of the chapter. We had to put them there. That's the first thing that Edco asked us to do is write down the learning objectives. So there's a list of them at the beginning of each chapter. And that is what you need to aim to really know so, so that you're well prepared going into the exam. The second thing is, is that instead of focusing on, I'm going to study for four hours, or I'm going to study for one hour, or I'm going to study for half an hour, is and instead put your focus on, I'm going to really understand one thing. And what does really understanding one thing means? It means reading the material and understanding it, in my opinion, summarizing it as well so that, so that you've got your notes. And we do our best in the book to highlight the definitions or to give you some exam tips along the way. Like we do seek to kind of make it as succinct um, as possible so that it's, it's visually easy to learn. That is our intent. Of course, feel free to give me any feedback that you might like, but anyway. And then from there, I would then go on to say, okay, I'm going to do either the questions at the back. Maybe if you're in fifth year, that might be a, a better place to be at the earlier stages rather than the exam questions. They might be a bit more advanced, um, given, of course, exam questions are asked at the end of sixth year. But asking yourself a question or asking, answering the questions, 
then comparing the questions to the answers and then noting down what would I have needed to do to get that right. And that's what I would say would be an effective study session, not time. Because I find if it is time, well, then you can kind of drift off and it's easy to say, right, I've succeeded if I sat here for four hours and I, you know, didn't move. Mm, as I say, I could come in here on any given day and sit here for four hours and I could do nothing. So that's what I would say. And I would very much also echo this idea when it comes to any type of study, but also even in the workplace. In the workplace as well, even when it comes to my own staff, I, I don't watch what time they come in. I don't watch what time they go. That's, that's none of my business really to a large degree. Instead, we have a project management system. Tasks are there. And then it's up to me generally to assign the tasks based on what the client wants. And then in there, it's say, okay, this needs to be done by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or else they work out between them what can be done by when. And that is what the working world is more so like today, is making sure that people do what they need to do by the time it needs to be done so that other people can get on with their work, or the client needs whatever they need. That's, that's what's important. So that would be my second one, is focus on the learning objectives. And again, to summarize, learning objectives at the beginning, to know, know what you need to know, um, exercises, a summary, and then also what you need to do in order to get to get that right. All right. Number three is this one is observe trends. I do this all the time. Observe trends. So I put I put a picture here on the left of uh, two restaurant owners. And I anytime I go like anywhere, I could be in a taxi. I could be out for breakfast. I could be walking like I mentioned to you walking down the walking down the aisle of, of super value. I could be um, talking to the thousands of teenagers that we work with every year. I could be reading an article. I'm always observing trends. And that's how you, that's there. That's how you spot an economist. An economist is always, always just sees trends. And this is super important, particularly when it comes to your economics project. It's very important for you to be able to identify trends. That's part of the research study that, that you need to have. So, like you might say, well, like what sort of trends am I supposed to be seeing? Well, like I mentioned, the one that I'm being asked all the time about these days is inflation. So can you see inflation when it is that you're maybe buying tickets for the cinema or tickets for a football match or um, the cost of school books or the cost of a sandwich in the shop or any like you think about anything you're spending money on. Observe, just observe, just see where prices are going. Many, many people at the moment are talking about, say, the rising cost of energy. So I see it in the bills coming in. But then, of course, I also see the credits that the government is giving to overcome or, or deal with that as well. Well, there was one anywhere earlier on. And based on what happened in the budget, there'll be more. But the point is, is that I'm watching that. I can see that. If I was to say to you as well, like, think about the trends of maybe just one I'm, I'm working with a group of, of teenagers at the moment you probably any of you that checked the instagram stories you'll have seen we're we're, we're running the transition year work experience for the society of actuaries this week and so the focus that we have with the group that, that are in at the moment is entirely around jobs in the actuarial profession and when 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 i look at the, the trends of what i'm seeing this week what they're talking about is first of all sustainability is the growth in the jobs available now for people to work in sustainability this is because the sustainable development goals are obviously they require people to be able to go and implement them there's actual actuaries now are being brought in to factor the risk of environmental impacts on um on businesses on where business can businesses can locate on if there's going to be lower travel so that how do people work now without traveling to each other um, people having to put more money into negating any environmental impact they're having, changing vehicles from petrol or diesel to electric, all these types of things are what are what actuaries have, are doing within their jobs. So there's a trend as well that I'm watching and I can see how this is changing the nature of that specific job. And we run work experiences like all across various different sectors. So I'm, I'm joining the dots then as I'm watching the various different ones and what's coming up in there. The, another trend that's coming up more and more, and this is where, again, economics is so helpful, is there's more and more demand, I find, in the labour market for people with critical thinking skills. And that's what the economics project really and truly pushes you to do, is to critically analyse, is to look at something and wonder why. Why is it like that? How can it be different? 
if something changed, what could change? What could make a difference? So, for example, at the moment, I always learned in school, as you learn in positive economics or however you're, you're, you're studying economics this year, you learn that like, interest rates affect inflation. Is that if you put up the cost of borrowing, well, then what should happen is that it slows down the economy and then people spend less and then that holds back prices. Okay. And that, generally speaking, is the case. But this year, we're in a very different scenario because of the war in Ukraine. And as a result, there's like I saw, I was looking at the uh, State of the Na State of the Union address that Ursula van der Leyen gave two weeks ago. I was uh, giving a webinar um, all around the, the very things I'm talking to you about now for the Institute of Banking. Um, as a practicing economist, you're, you're often asked to present an economic snapshot on something to a group of people to help them observe the trends. But anyway, Ursula, Ursula van der Leyen was just talking about the fact that last year that we as a Euro European Union was um, it imported 40 percent of gas from Russia. And that's now down to nine percent, for example. So as a result that we're bringing in less gas from that particular area, then, of course, what happens? Well, if you decrease the supply, the price goes up. And of course, we're not changing demand necessarily. So the price goes up or you find a new supply. And that, of course, then she was talking about how there's going to be so much more money put into hydrogen energy, for example, across the EU. Well, what do you need if you need hydrogen energy? Yes, you need a lot of money. Yes, you need a lot of equipment, but you need a lot of people who are very good at analyzing that. Physicists, engineers, geologists, regulation people, economists, etc. So critical analysis is being able to think critically, being able to not just see things and accept them as they are, but question why. Why is it that inflation is happening? Why is it that if you affect interest rates, it's not having the same effect on inflation? And it's not. It's not. It's not because this time it's not just about people spending more and more. It's actually about one particular commodity, namely energy, going up a price, which is also being affected by something outside of the, central, the European Central Bank's control. So critical analysis, if you can think critically. So I would say to you, in jobs in the future, you may well be asked, Tell us about a time you thought critically or tell us about a time when you challenged the assumptions or tell us about a time when you had to investigate a topic. Your economics project can be your answer. Uh, and that's another respective trend that we're seeing in the market in the workplace now is competency based interviews. A competency based interview is when you're asked a question like, tell me about a time you worked in a team. Tell me about a time you overcame a problem. Tell me about a time that you disagreed with your boss. Tell me about a time that you etc. So th that's the way in which people these days are being interviewed for jobs is tell me about a time that you showed a competency. And there's so much in your study of economics that you can answer. So whether it's your project or whether it's uh, st studying for an exam or whether it's observing the trends, etc. All of that is an example of thinking critically. So what I would say to you here is observe what's going on around you and it'll make it so much easier then to think of the answers. So and I've looked at obviously the exams over the years since I've started writing the book with Brian and Trudy and we've been, our positive economics has been in the market now, we published for the first time in 2013. So we're almost 10 years old. So I've been looking at exam papers all throughout that time. And a lot of the time they ask you for an example of, or you have to think about a time that, or think about what, what you know, government decision could be done in order to deal with this problem. Just look around you. Just look around you. As I say, talk to people if you're in, if you're in a restaurant, observe what's the prices of things as you're paying for them, or even observe where people are paying for them. Like I'm paying more and more now off the watch because I just hold the watch up there and then it scans and then that links back then to, uh, to a payment app. That's also another trend. Trends are everywhere, but they also, as I say, can help you think critically as well. Okay, my next one, number four, is to use social media to your advantage. So follow certain accounts on on social media so that then you'll basically get naturally updated on data so then when it comes to going into the exam then you won't have to be trying to think oh what is the latest inflation figure for etc so i'm going to give you a couple of examples okay uh, i'm going to give you both twitter and instagram so in instagram for a start i would definitely start off with cso ireland yeah here we are so cso ireland in here now look at their look at their grid Look down here, you can see that they often post pictures with numbers. So in here, this can be a really easy way simply to keep up with them. You can also see as well that in their stories, in their highlights here, 
they also are sharing infographics. Now I'm okay, there we go. The labor force, sorry, I'll just pause that. The labor force survey Q2 2022. Look at this. I'm always intrigued with this figure. We have the highest number of people in employment ever in the history of the state, two and a half million. Two and a half million people. And this this particular picture, by the way, was the one one of them that I presented to the Institute of Banking two weeks ago. It's this is exactly what an economist does: is that they take data that's out there, they help explain it to an audience. Or in my case, I'm explaining. Like in this case, I was taking this and then I drilled down into where the employment shortages were. I talked about where the fastest growing of employment was. I mentioned Springboard as a government initiative to fill the skills gap. I spoke about hidden employment. I spoke about push and pull factors, the factors that could make certain employment risky, who was letting people go, where those people were going. Like that's my job. Your job, on the other hand, is to simply understand the nuts and bolts of how this works. And by just following these accounts on Instagram, then you, they just appear in your feed. And you don't have to like get into the, you know, really, really try to get to grips with all this. The fact that it's there and in front of you, and as you're going through your feed, it just goes in. Also, I find like this number over here is interesting. Q2 2020, second quarter. So second quarter 2020, we were in the teeth of lockdown. 61 million hours were worked per week. And that is up by a third. That is up a third. Another 20 on top of that uh, was worked in Q2 2022. So it just shows you how the pandemic and well, not the pandemic, but the lockdown really slowed down the amount of hours worked, which of course we all know. And then, then we could go into another conversation all around how how the the labour market was pulled back up by government supports and all that sort of thing. Okay, so there are some of the stories um, that they that they talk about. They also have jobs jobs there as well that they mention and um, other other things. So what I would do is just have a think about what type of uh, of accounts that you can follow there on uh, on Instagram. When it comes to Twitter, what I'm going to do is I am going to point out to you what I would follow is the hashtag LC Economics. Um, and there's some just people who tweet about this all the time. Okay, all the time. This is uh, Caroline McHale. This woman actually know very well. She's somebody that introduced me to Trudy, my fellow author for Positive Economics. So you can see here she. Uh, did this super job up here of explaining with post-its all of what happened in the budget. She does a, often does this. She does a super, super job of that. So that can be, um, that's certainly one. I'll just scroll on down here. Um, let me go down again here. Right. Energy. This is another teacher there. I may in fact even be here tonight. Um, Dear McCanning often tweets as well. And he talks about energy price inflation across the OECD. And he shows you here where Europe is, or says you, where's Ireland? There we are, Ireland is slightly higher. So, and he often, often quotes. So if you look at LC Economics, then you can look, take a look there at the various different um, accounts then that you might go on to study. So uh, I'll often tweet on that, on that one as well. Uh, let me see. That. Anyway, there's loads more, loads, loads more in there. Oh, this one as well. The results of our back to school strategies Q and A or Insta. Okay, then yeah, there's loads, loads in there. So that's that's what I would say. Given the context of where we're at tonight, check out different accounts on Instagram and just follow them. And then similarly on L hashtag LC Economics. L so leaving search economics. Just going to put that there into the the chat there as well. Where are we gone? Yeah, I'll just put it, pop it in there. Okay, that's the hashtag that, that, I, that I suggest that, that you check out. Okay, and then for my final one is more so to do with exam questions. Now, um, what I, I think it's a very good time management te technique in general to do this is when you're doing exam questions, do so in timed conditions, even as early as early as you can. And I would say this for three reasons, right? Number one is that if you actually set a timer and you try to write a, a question, write the answer to a question under, under a period of time. Okay, actually, let me roll back a bit. Practice any question in time conditions. If you practice your homework, in fact, if you can set a timer and say, right, I am going to try to do this particular question in 20 minutes or 25 minutes, and then uh, see how you get on. Here's what it gets, here's the benefit of doing that. Number one, you get used to the time pressure. And of course, when you're in your mocks, when you're in your Christmas test, when you're in your leaving cert itself, it, time pressure can be something that worries people. Now, practice makes perfect like anything. 
time pressure can t- you can totally get used to that and the, if you try it with your homework it'll certainly help the second thing i would say is that it helps you um focus your mind again it stops the kind of like oh you know i'm just actually thinking now like do i will i watch this on netflix later on or will i not or uh, I'm going to a GA match now at the weekend. I wonder who's going to win. You know, it, it just stops your mind from wandering. If you're under a period of time pressure, again, it's something that, that I do a lot even to, to this day. Um, and the third thing is it helps you with your writing speed. So often I've had people ask me, how do I write faster? And I would say, you don't have to write faster in an exam condition at, at the same time. A good way to learn how to write faster is take, take a piece of text, right? So what have I got here? Right. I was MC for an event in Galway a couple of weeks ago, um, focusing on female entrepreneurship and they produced this booklet. Right. So let's say here's here's a page of this booklet. If I wanted to learn how to write faster, I would simply open up. I would open up this page and I would literally write what's here as fast as possible. That's all. I would not try to think about what's there because that's the key thing. I would not. I would just write this as fast as possible. And then I would look at the next page and I would on another day and I would write it as fast as possible. And then you just train your hand to get used to moving faster that's separate that's a whole other part that's a whole other thing to learn how to do as distinct to learning how to um answer questions more quickly leave that for another day to be able to come up with answers more quickly that's that's a different part of your brain that that you, that you can train but when it comes to writing faster just practice that first but when you're under time conditions then you kind of have that feeling of, okay i need to do this as quickly as i can so it can also help you in that regard. So it keeps your mind focused. It helps you get used to time pressure and it helps you increase your writing speed for all those reasons. And of course, the other benefit of this is that then you don't spend as long studying is because if you can actually take out of where you're not being productive well, and just increase the amount of time that you are being productive, it leaves more time for time off, rest, being with your friends, chilling out, et cetera. So if you learn how to be as productive as you can with the time that you're going to put in, and two key things I've said there will help you do that. Number one is focusing on learning objectives rather than time. And the second one is this. If you do that as well, if you focus on, right, I'm going to set X period of time to do X, to do Y task, and then see how you get on. And then the last thing that that will help you do as well is it will certainly give you a chance to be able to understand how well you estimate how long something will take you. That is also uh, what it'll do for you as well. So on that note, I'm going to stop there. It's just five to eight. So I'm going to stop there and I'm just going to see if there are any questions. Sorry, I'm just going to uh, stop sharing my screen there. And I'm just going to stop. Yeah. All right. So I'm now, if you want to pop in any questions, feel free to do that. If there's anything there that you want to put into the chat, feel free to do it there either. And I'm going to um, answer as many as I can. I'm also just going to check over here as well just to make sure if there's anything that have oh sorry i'm saying sorry to you but you can't see what i'm saying sorry for so i'm just going to check here as well if there is any of yeah anything here that, that i need to get back to um okay okay yeah first question in here is um how have i or uh, what do you recommend as regards sleep okay that's a little bit left of center but sure happy to take that Right. Here's what I would say about sleep is I actually use a sleep app. And it, I'm not going to necessarily mention which one they are, where they are. What I would say is that the sleep app has shown me my own patterns of when um, when I'm better off going to sleep, <laughs> when I'm uh, just also it shows me the regularity of times that I wake up, which would be pretty standard during the week bit different at the weekend um it but what it particularly shows me and this i find very interesting is it shows me the connection between the amount of sleep i've had and the amount of energy that i'm likely to have as a result and that is really i suppose again being the economist seeing the trend and also being somebody who likes to see a metric and also somebody that is always likes to see the results of something that i'm going to work on it actually just shows me the increase in my own ability to do whatever it is, whether it is, whether it's studying work or whether it's like I did a cycle at the weekend. Um, I did one for charity, actually, for prostate cancer on Saturday. It was 115 kilometers. Hope the cycle I've ever done in my life. But the it, it whether no matter what I'm doing, it does actually show me the connection between the two. So what I would say is 
for anybody who wants to improve their sleep is simply get a sleep app. There's free ones out there. There's paid ones out there, but just get a sleep app and it will prompt you to observe what, what you're doing and the impact of the decisions that you make. And I actually think that can help. It will certainly help you learn more about yourself anyway. That's for sure. And even if the sleep app that I use is pure nonsense, even if it like, even if it doesn't work, even if it's the, the what it says that it's built on doesn't work, it's, it is actually educating me more about sleep and it's making me sleep better. Now I'd be a good sleeper, but it's in better in terms of the regularity and the amount of time and all a few other things as well. I personally am feeling the benefit of it. So that's what I would say. Thanks for the question though. I didn't expect that one. And again, I'm just going to check there if there is anything else. Okay, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so if if there's anything else, of course, feel free. You have my Instagram there. I'm I'm on Twitter as well. Um, wherever you are, I probably am too. Uh, and so feel free to check in at, at any stage. And also, we will be following up. Our next webinar is going to be in December, and it is a deep dive into inflation. That is what I'm going to be. This time is going to be broad. The next time is going to be a deep dive into inflation. And we will follow up with an email uh, to everybody with the recording of this one and the link to register for the next one. OK, so on that note, everyone, thank you so much indeed for being here with me. As I say, it is recorded. We will be sending it out with the accompanying blog post. And I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you again and goodbye.